Everything's cool. There we go. We are live. Hello, every morning. Every morning? <laughs> Hello, every morning. Hi, morning. How you doing? <laughs> good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Uh, it's, hi, it's Natalie from Creative Makers. Thanks for being here. <sighs> I'm just taking it all in. Still running a million miles an hour. Um, I'm here today with Jeff Ross, fresh back from Japan. He's been back a whole week, so mm -hmm. hopefully he will not fall asleep in our interview. I think that he's uh, probably pretty, pretty fresh. Or pull up moment. a secret bowl of ramen and start <laughs> eating in front of you. Hello, three people. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, okay, so I'm just going to start with the first question, and then we'll just take it from there, okay? Okay, I'll so, see if I come up with the first fabrication of truth. Please, please do. Um, all right, so the thing I want to know about is I want to know about what creativity looked like for you as a kid. How did it start popping out? Um, I started doodling. Yeah. Just little doodles, um, which I saw a Mark Mothersbaugh exhibition in L.A. a long time ago. I'm sorry, say that name again. So Mark Mothersbaugh okay. from Devo. Okay. And he has this thing where he draws on little blank postcards uh -huh. from the post office. Oh. And it was an exhibition of 2,000 of these drawings. Was he doing them on tour or something? Yeah, doing on tour, doing them like that. So it triggered like, wait a minute, I was doodling. And so that's what started the adult doodling. So wait a minute. So, so how old were you when that happened? 86. I was... 25. All right, let's go back. I want to go back to when you were a kid. When I was a kid, like in, in, in like grade school and stuff, yeah. I doodled. And then there was a time where we had this little egg shape and in a like kind of a plastic stencil. And I would draw the egg shape and I would turn them into spaceships. Just over and over and over and over. You know, just bunches. And I was always self-entertained. Were you the art? We, were you the art kid when you were in school? I mean, were were was everybody like, "Oh, give it to Jeff, he'll draw it." No, 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 I was like the tiny kid that didn't talk, you know. And so when that those times we lived on farms in Ohio, and you have to self entertain on the oh, farm, and okay. their next house is two miles away, and being poor, you use what you had, and that's how. So I would just kind of, well, I've got this, and I'll do that. So now. When I have a bunch of something, it's kind of the same thing. Okay. I'm going to do all of these. Okay, so wait a minute. So, all right. So, then going through high school? High school, I took a art class. One art class. One art class. And we did a tempera resist painting. Yeah. Which was... With crayons and tempera? With um, tempera paint. You drew the still life. Filled it in with tempera paint. Yeah. And then you took a solution of... Uh, liquid soap and india ink yeah and paint it black oh and then you put it under the water mm -hmm. and wherever there wasn't tempera the black would stick to the paper so then it started looking like um like a linoleum print or kind something? of it's really a cool i have yet i think i tried it once in the last 50 years <laughs> but it's a pretty cool thing and then we did a perspective drawing uh-huh you know there we go. We're oh, back. We're good. Oh, did it um, leap? Yeah. And uh, the teacher put it up somewhere and it got stolen. And then I happened to run into that teacher a few years later at an arcade playing pinball. And he goes, you're the guy that did that perspective drawing. You know, so he remembered what I made and that it got stolen. <laughs> so was that a moment for you? Like knowing that the teacher knew who you were, remembered what happened? It was kind of cool, you know, it's just like, wow, okay, you know, and then after that, uh, I didn't really do much for a while, and then in 86, I started drawing again. Did you go to college? Half a semester. Half a semester, and it was not art focused. Uh, or was I I was going into forestry. I know that was what I was going to ask you. I was going to say, so what did you think that you were going to do? Well, I went to college because everybody's going to college. Right. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But you thought it was. I applied to one college, and CSU in Colorado. I'll go into forestry. I like trees. And then the first class they make you take was designed to make you not go into forestry. 
because there were no jobs. And then that semester, I saw the Ramones and I quit everything. Okay. All right. So now, now we're here. So when you saw the postcards uh, by the guy from Devo mm -hmm. in that, it was a show, right? Yeah. Okay. Was it before or after you saw the Ramones? It was after. Okay. And just for those of you that don't know, hi, Cheryl. The, for those of you don't, that don't know who the Ramones are, in case this wasn't your cup of tea back way back in the day. 1979. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were a sort of a punk, pop punk band, yep. I, would, I would say. Yeah. Uh, you know, they dressed crazy. They had weird names. And they were all last named Ramon. Uh, not really. But for the for the intensive mm -hmm. purposes of their band yeah. they were and I've al I've always said seeing the Ramones saved me from a life of utter mediocrity. Yeah, they're just fun and goofy. I love them too. Yeah, I knew of it and but in high school we were you know foreigner Leonard Skinner to Nugent Sticks all that. Yeah. And then I was listening to the Joe Jackson song on the radio, uh, is she really going, going out, out with him? him. Yeah. B-52s and Devo oh, on yeah. Saturday Night Live. I saw the Ramones on Midnight Special, I swear, you know, one night. And it's just like, what is this? That's kind of cool. I don't get it, but it's kind of cool. Yeah, because it's super so, And energetic. then I saw them, and it just it blew the roof off of being normal. <laughs> you know so you just you found your tribe in that moment found, found the found tribe yeah i mean in the town in fort collins colorado there was eight of us who were skateboarders punk rock skateboarders in a town of cowboys and football players right right and and fort collins there's a college there too right it's yes yes school. you that's where i went yeah. to school um wow okay so all right so now you're at this point you see this show and you see the postcards and it clicks for you. Everything starts clicking. You know, we started, we, it was atypical. We're going to see shows and the band suck. We need to start our own band. We didn't, no one knew how to play. So it was complete punk rock, you know, and we had a band and that we practiced six nights a week, you know, That's a lot and of four with it, there was nothing else to do. Yeah. Skateboard and get chased by football players and, you know, practice so and what, then did you play did you learn to play an instrument i was a singer at you first. were the singer i was a singer at first then we and then then like within months we had a sh offshoot band and i started playing drums okay so uh, okay what you don't know is we were having a conversation before we got here and he was just telling me about how much he doesn't like talking to people and now i'm finding out that he actually was the singer of a punk rock band mm -hmm. it, it's the opposite of not talking to people almost yeah yeah it was <laughs> I know people avoided me after shows. I was just crazy? A, I was just a maniac. Yeah. You should talk to Dave. My gosh, it sounds like Dave's thing. Too. You know, yeah. just and and no one knew what was going on. I mean, it was really where we were. We drive to Denver every weekend, go see shows, go to Wax Tracks, buy music, drive back, listen to those three records over and over for a week, and then do it all over. And then go back again. Wow. You know, and stuff and. All right, so you saw these shows. I'm going. Out, I mean, you saw these cards that that the Devo guy Mark did. Yeah, and, and that then, was like, oh wait, I used to doodle, and I was just like, well, I went and bought some of the blank white post office postcards uh -huh. and started doodling. And just started doing the and then following in his footsteps. Yeah, then I just kept then I kept drawing. You know, just now when drawing. I think about you and your art, I always think about doodling. Mm -hmm. That. That this is what I see from you. This has become like synonymous with who you are. Is this the only the sort of thing that you completely focus on, for the most part? Well, there's, I do so many kinds of different like different work. But it's still all doodle esque. It's all live. Okay. I don't Define sketch. Live. Don't I don't sketch. sketch. Okay. I don't do studies. You're I not don't. Thinking. You're just going. It it's like I'll think of something. But as soon as my hand starts moving, my hand is doing the thinking. And so, so you're not directing. You're I'm not directing. I what I call reactionary abstraction. What whatever just happened is what's driving this to do something else. This is a really interesting way to work. So it's how does the paint move? You know, how does my hand move? Like I painted in a street art festival in Sweden, did a wall, and I was like, I don't know if people like it. Because it's not graffiti, but everybody loved it because it wasn't graffiti. 
Right. So the next year I went back, I had a different idea in my head. Okay, I'm going to do this. But as soon as my hand started moving, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm doing this. And so make the shapes, make more shapes. And then when I would like with the, with the black lines and stuff, that's when I start breaking it up and it morphs into something. But overall, I don't have a concept up here. So, I mean, in your, dis in your remembering how to doodle and stuff, did you ever have the curiosity? Well, I wonder if I can actually, or if I should like actually draw a picture of something that's live in front of me. Um, I, I went through a phase where I took photos of Iggy Pop mm -hmm. and I, back then those little doodles became what I kind of called psychedelic tribal, mm -hmm. you know, cause that's when the whole, uh, tribal tattoo thing kind of exploded, Okay. you know, and I, mine was more psychedelic, you know, I could see things in it, but then I would do some where I had photographs of Iggy and I, that tribal stuff works good to make bodies mm -hmm. or arms or, you know, cause when I, I was pretty kind of good at making, making body parts you mm -hmm. know with the shapes mm -hmm. like a for a while for a short time i did that where you put the pencil down and you don't lift it up right and you draw it and yeah. i did five or six of those and i was like okay done <laughs> yeah now let's go back let's go to that too because i know that you described to me the last time we talked about it that you're a guy that gets an idea and then you want to work the idea completely all the way through and you do it very quickly i can do it very quickly but what i've learned to do is slow down and let it slowly progress now what now why why did you because change? if i come up with an idea and i like it I will morph through every phase of it in three or four pieces and it's done. It's over. So I'm savoring yeah. the stuff, yeah. you know, and then um, I just, and it, it depends on my material. It depends on what I'm using, where I'm at, how much space I, I I'm, I adapt to where I'm, what I'm doing. So I'm good at staying creative. Mm-hmm. And just using and however, whatever I can. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I do have the grandiose. I want this beautiful, huge studio. I can do 40-foot collages, and I can do all this screen printing, and I can do this, but that's never going to happen. What I do want to tell you guys is that we're in Joshua Tree, California. We're at the Joshua Tree Retreat Center. And he's actually, this, are we calling this a residency, so to speak? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's a resident, an artist in resident here on the property. So, I mean, he has use of the space. He's got a space to live in. Um, we won't talk about the, um, how good or bad the space is. The inconveniences and the pluses <laughs> or minuses. Yeah. We won't talk about I'm that. I'm It's continually, I adapt. Yeah. And this, and then that's especially with the work that I do. But, but this, I mean, but there is a space here for him and, and all he has to do is produce art, mm -hmm. which is a very cool thing. Yeah. There are places also that offer these sorts of things. Hi, Dale. I saw your name pop up. Uh, we have, just so you know, we have six people okay. watching at this moment in time. I don't know if you can see that, but this is always lovely. Okay, so, all right, you've been all over the world doing mm -hmm. stuff. How did that happen? I mean, if okay, so you're doing these things. You, you started doodling on these cards. What happened next? How, how did you start becoming an artist um, and getting I, people, in, were people buying things? What? No, no. In 1986, a friend's band in Denver was going on tour. I bought a book on how to screen print. Oh. I made a screen. I printed the shirts. We went on tour. Were you doing screen printing live? Like, well, no, 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 oh, okay. no. I mean, I, this, I built a little one color thing. I hand stretched a screen. It was pretty, pretty nuts. Now that I know how to do it and how I did it back then. So, but, I mean, well, and so went on tour and then that's where I kind of started printing for bands. So that oh. there's that creative side. You know, I had some stuff I came up with. I had stuff people gave me completely finished. So I had a screen printing business for 20 years. 
I see. Okay. So, so that's how it happened. You did one band and all of a sudden everybody was like, then hey, can you start do this doing, for me too? You know, move to LA, you know, then make a screen and print for a band. And then the Denver band was connected to Seattle and I was in, it's one of these things, you know, triangle, doink, doink, doink. So were you just taking, you were in LA at that point? I was in LA then. And then I moved to Seattle in 1989. Okay. And were you just, were people sending you stuff or were you actually, okay? Yeah, people would send me stuff. And then you would just send it back to them? And yeah, or they'd there? pick them up in LA, the shirts and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it wound up being a business that I had for 20 years. Wow. And so once the business was running, then I started going to Europe. I'm going to France for a month. The business can run itself. I'm going here for two months. Excuse me. Um, and then, then did that whole, did the whole cycle. And then when I closed the business in 2006, then I started, I was picture framing, but then I started just making art. So 1999 was when I started really thinking about it. So, so all the trips that you took uh, while you were having your screen printing business, they weren't art trips at all. I was art collecting then. You were art collecting. Mm -hmm. And what kind of art were you collecting? All the outsider, what they call outsider. Yeah, yeah. So back then, I called it folk art. Right. Then it was outsider, self-taught, intuitive. They had all these names. And then they finally settled on outsider as the genre. Right. Now, do you see yourself as an outsider artist? I'm completely that. I'm completely self-taught. But the problem is I taught myself too much. (laughs) And then on the other side, I never went to school, so I don't have a fine arts degree. So I'm in a gray zone. I'm too, too taught, so I can't be the wacko outsider, which I truly am. Because all the art I collected and all the artists I met, we're all very obsessive with what we do. We just make it. We make it go. Make it go. Now, just, why do you think that you're too educated, too self-taught? I know too much. I taught myself too much. I know, but what what does that even mean? It's, well, I mean, the connotations way back then in the late 70s, 80s it was like, well, we're going to go out into the woods and we're going to find this guy who paints. And we're going to, he has no TV, he's got no, the true outsider is zero outside influence. Yeah. You know, so So you think in the 70s, 80s, yes, there was plenty of those. And then I got into it in the 90s and I started traveling to go find the artists, to stay at their house, to meet them, buy, just buy whatever I could. And And I bought it because you saw yourself. I bought it for the love of the art. You know, so I build a collection up of about 800 pieces oh my God. over 15 years. Where are all, where's all this? It's work? in storage in Denver. Oh my God. So, um, and it's, I was doing it in the South and then I reached a point with that, at that time outsider art was getting written up in ink magazine and Forbes as an investment. And that just, that destroyed the whole thing because there was only a finite amount of art that existed like that because most of the artists were already dead. Mm -hmm. Then, oh, this guy's an outsider art. This guy's an, it's just like. Well, I feel like now they they attribute more outsider art to like people with disabilities. Well, there is that whole genre. I collected a lot from art centers. I love that work. I mean, it's the same to me. It's not, you know, it's not disabled art. No. It's art. Right. And these centers are pretty amazing places. I just call I just think of it that way because sometimes when disabled people are un, unable to connect with whatever we call the real world, I don't know, mm-hmm. I, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that makes them less influenced by the outside. Yeah. That that's why. I, I mean, the that. art centers, I mean, I've been around to them all over the world. You know, it's all it's it's a good thing, you know. But yeah, that's that's what people initially think. When you say outsider, mm-hmm. oh, it's somebody who's not all there or not physically there. But I'm like, I met an artist in North Carolina. He had a job until he was 62. He got laid off. And then just started, he started painting. Yeah. You know, I mean, I got, I hurt myself in 2010. You know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm in, it's the same thing. I can't do what I did before. 
you know, so, but that, but that whole, you know, outsider world got gigantic. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's like, I can't, I mean, I create the way I create the same way. I'm not but, sure that having the art degree really means that much anymore. I mean, honesty. I mean, it's hard to deal with like going to a gallery and you well, know, that's, this. And that's... I mean, I barnstormed a gallery in Denver, you know, years ago. I was like, hey, I've got all my stuff in the car. You want to look at it? Then the woman's like, bring it in, you know. And she goes, I like what you're doing, but I need to see more. I need to see how it goes. So a year later, I showed, hey, I've got stuff in the car. Bring it in, you know. And? But it never, then I moved out of country. And then she passed away. Oh. Um, she was really cool. Robin Rule, she has a gallery. There's a gallery in Denver still. But she's an abstract person. I mean, there's, I mean, this, now you're talking about a whole nother side of art, like the art business world. Yeah. Which you know, is, is not the creation aspect yeah. of it. It's, it's the business aspect. And that's a whole nother. Thing. I mean, that's all like, do we do, and do you, are you good at business if you're creating? No. Well, I, I mean, I think people flip back and forth depending yeah. on who they are. I mean, me running my business for that long, I do have a right. sense, you have but to. it's, I get, I get tangented and I start working and it's just like, I don't care. You know, I'm, I don't care what's going on. I'm drawing. You know, or I have a tablet of 20 sheets. It's not done until all 20 are finished. Do you find that drawing, like, especially in that, like, scratches an itch somewhere in your head? I mean, do you, I mean, that call, that kind of call where you are like, I don't care about anything else. And I just want to finish this. Yeah. Well, I mean, when it's I, whole, when I discovered the Posca markers in Thailand, um, it's just like, oh, and I'm drawing and I'm drawing and I'm drawing. And I don't even want to leave my apartment just to go get more Poscas and more paper. Mm -hmm. But a buddy of mine in Switzerland who knows about the outsider collect, he goes, you need to get out because you're going to turn into that guy you go visit in some apartment or some house and it's floor to ceiling full of your art. I mean, you never left. Right. What, what is um, Gustav Anderson always says? He says, you don't want to become your own collector. Right. You know? You know. he's like you, you got to move it you got to move the work so you can make more work you don't want to be your own biggest collector yeah i mean it's it's an anchor yeah yeah i mean i have 11 flat files oh. full <laughs> all right so so in 1999 you were like this is what i'm going to start doing yeah just to have the same friend in switzerland saw a video of a print collective called the denier cree in marseille uh -huh. the this last the last scream Mm -hmm. and uh there were they were printing crazy stuff and we're all screen printers and he back then he called me you know there's no internet yet right. i just saw this video this guy i can't believe it and it just got me all excited and i went down to my shop and made a gigantic mess printing with everything that you don't print with and i made this huge mess and it was just like what do you mean that printing was, with everything you don't I was with? using rolling pins instead of squeegees. I was using plexiglass instead of screens. I was just throwing You were just I was throwing everything just, at what I had. And then I'm looking and it's like, ooh. And so the next weekend I did new stuff. And then I did, you know, did a hundred pieces in a day. And then next week I did another hundred. Then another hundred, you know. Of a technique I just came up with. Right. And that's the, probably the one incredibly unique thing I ever did. That was no retro involved or seeing stuff or. And then you just, the, this all had, you just got triggered by this conversation where the, he was just talking about. Yeah, he was all excited on the phone, got me all excited on the phone. And I went and made a mess. You know, shop was closed on the weekend, you know, and just I went in and, was, well, this is my shop. So I just started doing stuff and that's where it, that's where it started snowballing because then the shop was running and I got a space across the hall from my studio and I just started painting. Um, so, and so a friend in the building I was in, she came in, I just finished my first art class. I'm so excited. You know, and she goes, I want to take another one. I go, I'll take one with you. 
if you want. I'll go with, you know, an introduction to abstract and oils. It was two days a week, four hours a day, you know, wow. like at the Pratt School in Seattle. So uh-huh. it's not. It was not official teaching and this right. and that. Right, okay. It was, and it was like Parks and Rec sort of thing. Kind of, yeah. You know, and I took pieces of squeegees because I never used brushes. Mm-hmm. So I'm squeegeeing oil paint, you know, and it, unlo- it unlocked everything. And I just t- it just took off from there. So I took that class. It was two times a week for six weeks. I made in three months, I made 60 or 70 four by four foot paintings. Uh, uh, I'm going to repeat this 60 or 70 four feet by four feet paintings, all done with oils. Oil in a couple months. Okay. And they were abstracts. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm, but still, that's a lot of work. Pushing, pulling paint, and then that is a lot of work. That teacher. At that time, he goes, do you know who Gerhard Richter is? I'm I remember like, you bringing this up like, before. I'm like, no. So I started going to bookstores looking for used books, and then I found a Richter book, and this is like, oh, oh, oh. Was it a lot oh, yours? Yeah, yeah it, it was one of those ah oh moments. You know, so I bought all the books I could find, and then at that time, I was trying to talk to galleries in Seattle. Oh, you're just a squeegee painter. I'm like, so what? You know, and two years later, they all had squeegee painters. I've always been ahead of the curve. Right. In the music we did, I'll, I've always been ahead of the curve, and I'm always morphing into something else by the time everybody else this is, is, up. is yeah. all hip and cool. Yeah. You know? So I'm constantly stubbing my toe, running forward. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I want to see. I want to see if there's anybody. Anybody saying anything right now? Hi, Georgia. Hello, Carol. Hello, Cheryl. Hello, Clifton. Hi, Dale. We already said hi. Hi, Joe. Joe Alvarez is watching. Okay. Laura Fertino Cottrell is watching. Hey, Laura. Oh, cancel. Cancel. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. All right. So, so, okay. So you're doing all this stuff. You've suddenly gotten unlocked into this place, mm-hmm. this abstract painting place, but you're still... You're, you're still screen printing for work. Yeah, the money. business is still doing its thing. And and so okay, so now what? You've got all these paintings. You've you've unlocked all this stuff. How are people finding you? Are you selling work? What no, I wasn't. Are I mean, you showing? We we in Seattle in that year, we did a citywide thing called Art Detour. So it was a map of all the artist studios all over Seattle itself. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just strung wires and had 15 foot by 20 foot grids of my pieces in my shop mm-hmm. you know and do you pe- have a lot of people come through eh, not really maybe 20 in the weekend and then uh, that's the problem with having a citywide thing where people have to take their cars going from place to place if right not all in yeah distance. i mean it was okay yeah. i mean um but one one person goes are these computer generated i go you can leave right now <gasps> You can just walk out right now. If you think these are computer generated, go away. You could have just said, no, they're not. Well, it's just, you know, <laughs> it's just like he gave me that, that look back then in 1999. It's like, dude, get away from me. <laughs> you know? oh I busted my ass doing all this, you know. So, um, But then I just kept experimenting and, you know, making more, again, making rusted metal sculptures out of found stuff because I was a river guide a whitewater guide and I would pull all this metal out of the river and bind it with wire. And it's just like, Oh, that's a death trap. You know, that all wound up just rot- rotting in my sister's backyard. Yeah. You that's know? Right. And, um, but then I just kept going and then, um, ran the cycle. And then in 2006, I shut the business down and it's like full time. Now, why did you shut the business down? Because I would take it that it, it was, was still successful. No, it was, uh, it was the second full cycle. So start off printing in a garage, went up, had 10 employees, Mm -hmm. lose 60% of your business, have four employees, lose 50% of the business, have two employees, Mm -hmm. lose more. I quit. Okay. You know, it's just, I quit. I'm done. You know, it's my turn. 
So I was still picture framing, you know, making some money doing that. But then I just started painting and drawing full, you know, full time. I saved money and I've been living on the money. Okay. So I couldn't do this if I hadn't saved money at all. So all those years of working really mm-hmm. served you in this manner because yeah. it freed you up to yeah, be able 25 to years of hunkering down and now just living very minimal. Yeah. So I can, like when I was doing the art collecting, I was making money. Uh-huh. I was spending money. Right. Buying art. Right. I go to Europe and go. Bring what are you going to do with all that work that you collected? Um, I mean, are you going to eventually uh, sell it off to like keep supporting yourself? Or are you going to no, actually donate right, no, it to something? No, I need to write the book of the traveling mm-hmm. to buy the art. Mm-hmm. Because I started, I'd have to write 800 blurbs, you know, one for each piece. Like what I was doing, where I got it, who I met. What and I, I take it you have a really great memory and you've got all this stuff in your head. It's kind of in there, yeah. yeah. When I look at the art, it'll bring back where I got it and the story. It's all about the stories of visiting the artist. Right. And what you found there. And everything has a story. It's not just like for the longest time, people were like, that's a really good investment. It's like, and that's not why I'm doing this. Yeah. I do this because I love it. And I like traveling and I'm meeting all these people, you know, and if I write the book, then maybe I can exhibit the collection. It's sort of how I feel about talking to artists every week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. I like it. Um, you know, so, I mean, I did it. I did it until I shut the business down. And then uh, the, fl- the free-flowing money stopped. And I had to go cold turkey. Wow. And that was just like, I have to sell a piece of art to buy a piece of art. So that's the deal you made your, with yourself? With myself. I mean, there was when I decided that I'm closing the shop. I can't do this anymore. There was one artist I'd been trying to meet for five years. Did you finally get to meet him? I got to meet him. Who was it? You know, Francois Berland. He's from Switzerland. Mm-hmm. And I have his work, but I never got to meet him. And there was, that, I wanted a piece from his first phase of his works. So I knew I was going to go see him. I, that was my exception to the rule. And went and met him, and I asked him about the piece. And he goes, let me go look. Went into the studio, came out, and he laid three of them on the floor. And I'm just like, <sighs> you know. Did you buy all three? No, I can only afford one. So. Just... Was it everything you were hoping for when you got to meet him? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I mean... sometimes, you know, when you wait so long for something, and then you finally get it, and you go, eh. You know what? It wasn't the way I thought. It was I mean, I met be. I met some of the the greatest times when I happened to meet them. Like I knew of an artist named Pierre Carbonell. He was friends with Jean de Buffet. I, mean, right. I know none of these. That's the so early that. early art brute, the beginning mm-hmm. of all that. And so I'm visiting a friend who was a editor for Raw Vision magazine, the mm-hmm. the outsider art magazine, and we're talking, and he gets a phone call. You know, and he goes, and he's on, he hangs up, and then we're talking about Pierre Carbonell. And he goes, wait a minute, that was just him on the phone. Do you want to go meet him? It was like a two-hour train ride from Paris. I'm like, yeah. Called him back. Okay, you have to be at the train station at this town at 11.30 tomorrow. I'm like, oh. All right. One more time. This is... Third time's a charm, right? Yeah. Third yeah. time's a charm. <laughs> Smoke signals later. Oh, my God. If, if I lose you, I, I, I fear that this might be the last time. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Sorry again. And uh, here we are one more time. Craptacular Wi-Fi signal. I'm hoping that I've got this straightened out now. We're sort of in a remote area, so I'm hoping that it works. Okay. So the last thing that I talk to you about was I was asking about making money Mm -hmm. and selling work. All right. So where are we? (laughs) Continue. Yeah. It's a very hit or miss. we got two people back. You know, very hit or miss. Yeah. So, I mean, is it just by chance when it happens? Yeah. Well, I mean, you do like when I lived in Thailand for seven years. Okay. So see, there's these things that have happened 
Like, how did you get to Thailand living in for, there for seven years? Was it art related? Uh, it was back in the 90s. Friends were going to Thailand. Come to Thailand. It's like, no, I'm going to Europe. I'm Europe boy going, spending all the time there. And then some some friends wound up moving there and showed a picture of their teak house on stilts on the island. Hey, this is, uh, I'll come visit. Were so, you in Phuket or something? No, I was in Samui. Okay. Koh Samui. And uh, I went to Thailand and another friend who promoted art shows in Seattle, record store in Philadelphia, um, he goes, hey, if you go to Thailand, look up Chip Seven. He's a graffiti guy. And back then, so I'm on Facebook, Chip Seven. Hey, Chip, I'm coming to visit. You want to meet up? Yeah, sure. And so I met Chip. And then his, his friend he was sharing the studio with, Comb, was a screen printer. And we just clicked. The three of us just clicked. I mean, if I had not met Chip and Comb, I never would have gone back. It would have been a one-time visit to Thailand. Mm-hmm. So then I came back, we hung out more, then I met more people in the graffiti world and in the art world and in the music world, and it snowballed and I moved. Okay. What, did you consider yourself a graffiti artist? No, I, I still don't. I, I'm i not a graffiti artist. I'm not a muralist. I'm a wall painter. Please define. <laughs> I just paint. And it's always abstract, so it's right. not it's not a a theme of, you know, a mural theme. And I'm, I've never, I did, I did one piece of graffiti in the eighties and it was pretty bad. And at that time I was 23 and in LA you went to jail. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't need to go to jail. No. So that I just started taking pictures. If you wanted to come back to LA you and, know, and do graffiti. Or- I mean, I do what I do. It's like, I'm, I still cannot read wild style lettering. I, I'll never be able to decipher it. You know, all my friends just look at it and can read everything in a graffiti piece. I've never been able to read the words hidden. I didn't even know what wild style, that wild style was like a font of some sort. Yeah. That's the early, early, early thing, you know? So, I mean, when I was doing, when I was doing the psychedelic tribal stuff, I'd make things and then someone go, Hey, that looks like a goat. I'm like, all right, it's a goat. You saw a goat. Now I see a goat, you know? So, and all my stuff now, it's all, it's all just the motion. And then I clean it and it's done, you know? Okay. So, all right. So what about shows? Are you ever looking for shows? I mean, are people offering I, you I, shows? I, I, I'm the, I'm the person like that kid will hang a hard show anywhere. And I have hung art shows in weird places, but you do it and you had a show. Right. Yeah. You're not going to sell anything, you know, like, um, it's just, I'm not good at the management part of what I do, you know? So when you say the management part, you mean the business aspect? The business aspect, I don't have the discipline anymore. When I had my business, my books were to the penny every day. The invo- everything was done every mm-hmm. day. But when it started all going away, I just got lazy. And right. now I'm just like, shit, I'll just draw. You know, I should send an email out. Nah, I should have sent that email four days ago. I still haven't written it. I, th- I find So like as far as future stuff... I don't know what to do. So my perfect world is whoever the entity that may be, the manager, agent, publicist, any of that, which is all completely different jobs in this world. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, give me the answers to five questions. Number one, what type of my art? Number two, how big? Number three, how many? Number four, when, and number five, where. That's all I need. That's the th- th- that's the criteria you need in order to hang a show. Yep. So if they call yep. you and say, "I need you to do a show," you say, "Great, answer these five questions, and I'll be there." Then and, I can and, do and then, but fun. you know, I would do any show like that. You know, now it's just sort of like, well, now you have to think. Well, I don't need to frame all this stuff because these twenty pieces unframed is a stack about this big. 
if they're framed, it's a stack about this yeah. big. It's all coming back. It's not, you know. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's just kind of in. It's hard to it's hard to stay on top of all that. Do you find that your art is fulfilling you at least? It's keeping me from going crazy. Er. <laughs> If I don't make something for a few days, I start getting really antsy. Yeah. Like I, uh, and if I'm not somewhere else, then I get even antsier, you know? So being the nomadic artistic, that's good, except, oh, where's that brush? Oh, it's in a box over there. Right. You know, or I don't have, I need this paint or I have to look for this paint you know piecing it all together all right so why don't we pull a couple of pieces like you just came back from japan mm -hmm. and you came back from japan because you had work there basically mm -hmm. i mean you've been you've been dealing with some i got a call i got four art commissions while i was there okay and um, you got paid for them yeah okay good <laughs> you know. this is good um so while you were there you also you're the guy that just never stops you're on the train and you're drawing. Yeah. You're in a bar and you're drawing. Drawing, yeah. And you're having dinner and then you're drawing. Yeah. And I don't even. How many pieces did you do while you were gone? You were gone what? Three weeks. I was gone for two months. Oh, two months. I did seventy this size, four by six, little quick travel draws, and I did forty Posca drawings. Here, he's got a whole book here of the yeah. Posca drawings so that we can sort of see them like this hey do you want to talk about like what you're thinking oh i don't think i i, I was going to say we already established that you don't think yeah while you're drawing hands but the nice thing about poscas is that they're um they're so i was just talking about how vibrant and flat they are they're they're almost like prints in themselves yeah you know almost like screen print but, i mean just of every nature and how many did you do of these i did 40 some, of 40 those. some. Yeah. i mean that's 100 pieces of artwork already that you did in just a couple yeah couple months. now um, i'll be i can see that these you know they're like one and done's right yeah For i work i work really fast I mean, I wait. I, I waste more time waiting for paint to dry than I do slinging paint. And since I'm left-handed, I have to always pay attention because the left-hand smear happens. Right. So. Now, um, you also do you also use acemic writing in your work? Yeah, when I when I'm in the mood. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I don't see any in this stuff for right now. Yeah, no, this is its own. It's mildly aesthetic, aesthetic or whatever. Can, I, can we pull this thing that you do? Yeah. You also like to take images. I like to take older images, older found stuff. Which I think is really, really fun stuff, you know? And like this. Let me back it up. Just, oh. The glare there, that's a little bit better. Um, like a friend sent me, this is all from a, a calendar, and this this artist's name was Elvgren. Elvgren. Are these from Europe? No, these are American. Elfgren. And um, he had sent me a... Uh, um, like who's the famous guy that did the pinups? I uh, Did the know. cars cover and all. This oh. is sim He sent me a book on that guy's stuff, and he, this was a calendar. So I just drew on all of them. Yeah, so they're pinups with, with abstracts over them, which I think is, I love the combination of having something so tight against something that's so loose. Yeah. You know? I mean, the this is all, I had ankle surgery a year and a half ago, so I was laid up for three months, and I just drew in bed. Right, I'm going to just get a little closer so you can see the line, the line things. You know, these, these I... I would like to do sculptures. These would be great sculptures. This you know, piece how, how does how does Jeff go to three D? Oh, and Laura, uh, my question. Laura's saying that she he she thinks the artist is Vargas. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks, Laura. 
Yeah. These are awesome. And then, can you talk a little bit about this piece? Yeah, these are... Actually, I, don't know. I think that's what all this is. Is that... This is a book? Yeah, well, this is all the other ones I did. <laughs> See, I love, I love this idea, too, because this is, like, pages from magazines. I'm going to yeah, pull the, a couple the, of things. Uh, American Annual of Photography, 1946. But he just there's a there's a whole image underneath there. I don't know what it is, but I do see all the colors on top that he added, and I just I love the addition of this. It just makes it really interesting. Very very interesting. So like I had a 1946 and 1947. I bought them at a thrift store. Had them for about 15 years, and then it's like, oh wait, here's an idea. So this is all while I was here. Pull one of these. These are this is where you like showcasing Eleanor the Roosevelt. <laughs> Eleanor, <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. But I mean, this is a whole different way that a brain works. You know, I only know the way my own brain works. And mm -hmm. I just know that it's very different than the way my brain works. And I've been looking at these two magazines for 15 years, you know, and one day and, I, just, considering... I pulled it out and it was just like, you know, and I'm doing those. And then I was like, well, I'm going to put color over the top of these. So it's all very random. So... I like the way you have them all protected. Well, I'm, I'm kind of a nut. That That's the obsessive compulsive. I'm OCD. I'm not ADHD. I was going to ask I'm you. OCD. Uh, you know, I, took, I took the OCD test in therapy back in the Seattle days. And mm -hmm. if you got eight or nine out of 20 questions, you had OCD. And I got 19 Ooh. out of 20. So I'm like, I'm the perfect OCD weapon. Do you... Uh, <laughs> do you take stuff to no just, no you don't seem that ocd i mean you number one you're aware yeah number two i mean you're not at least not with me right now yeah. maybe maybe but i mean i can see how this work might be yeah you just keep going you and keep, keep going, going and keep going just, more one yeah, more compulsive, and compulsive. then no matter what i do i finish something i'll slide it over and i forget it it's over. It's, it's over. Done. You know, and what am I doing next? What am I doing more? Like, I finished a couple yesterday, and as I had two more sheets in the tablet, and it's just like, okay, I'm going to get these done. You yeah. Know? And then I finished them, completion. and it's just like, crap, I should have bought more paper when I was at Michael's. You know, I had the tablet in my hand. I, I got more left. Nope. Oops. You know, but it's good that I'm out. So I'll stop that for a couple days. Mm-hmm. Work on something else. Do something else. Yeah. Re re I'm shift gears a lot. So that's also another tricky part, I think, for me is I have so many styles of work, and then I have so many of everything. You know what? I you might it's be prolifically prolificity. <laughs> you know what though? I know that you you're saying that you have a lot of styles of work, but I mean, I see you in every piece. Yeah. There's no. It's, I, mean, I, I can tie them all together. You're, yeah, totally. But most people can. I want to do a group show where it's five different artists. And you're all five. All me, but I'm all five. <laughs> you're all five different artists. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Laura's saying that she loved the Eleanor. The Eleanor is really fun, right? It just it it just puts this glowing halo around her. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so it's so just I got, and then I've just got a stack of the papers with no pictures left, with just the words. I have like another 20 of those pages. Like, I'm not going to throw these out. Well, I'm sure I'm you're gonna, dying to finish I'm them. I'm going to use them for something. Yeah, of course. You know, so. I wonder if you collage those. There, there's been, I, I, I tried a couple things. I'll try it. And if it doesn't hit right then, I put it in a drawer. Mm -hmm. And then I'll find it later. And maybe it'll. Like, I, I have drawers of stuff that's like, Eh, that's yeah, not stuff, very good. Stuff you don't like. So I was scanning and photographing, um, and the scannings were taking a long time, so I took one of the eh ones, mm -hmm. and I drew on it. It's like, oh, bingo, and those were from 20 years ago. And so I took the stack of 60 of those that were the eh's, to Thailand, mm -hmm. drew them all, drew on all of them in two weeks. 
Did they all come back with you? They're, yeah, they're not here. They're in Denver, but they all okay. came back. I haven't shown them. You know, it's just like, this is, I mean, how, yeah, that's the whole. How long is your residency here? Until I'm not here. Oh, okay. so it's so it's an undefined. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Yeah. So that you don't have to worry about you know being pushed out or right. anything like yeah. that. Yeah. They're so like, just stay. take your time, develop, find, look. Now, are they asking for anything from you? I mean, do they want to show out of you once? Um, we were gonna. Point? We are still trying to figure out how to do screen printing workshops to teach printing. Mm -hmm. So. We'll see if it if it gets figured out. Now, um, one of the, the first time I met you, you were doing a screen printing thing at Juan Thorpe's place at Space yes. Printing Gallery. Mm -hmm. Was that your screen printing press? Yes. So you actually have a physical press. I mean, that's yeah, like a four color in, press, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you haul all this stuff around? I mean, when I came out here, I got a U-Haul cube, mm -hmm. filled it, and that was one of the important it. things you put in it. That it could fit, yeah. I'm good at fitting 90 pounds of shit in a 10 pound bag, so <laughs> me moving is pretty easy. It's more mental, mental puzzles, logic. How's this gonna fit? But um, I get it done. Now you took me around your house and you showed me a couple, some things that you're like. I started this. I don't know what I'm doing with it yet. I haven't. I have this idea, but I haven't finished it. What What are you hoping? I mean, what do you? Maybe it's something you haven't even started yet, but you're still it's still percolating and you're like, I gotta get to that. What's, what's I mean, in store? It's just it's more just doing the motion. Throwing the paint, mm -hmm. making stuff, and then seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'll look at it like what I did yesterday. And I'll look, I should just do that same stuff in more color. And I'll do the whole layer, and then I'll do another layer. And then just see where it goes. I have, there's something sticking in my brain. Mm -hmm, something that, that you're waiting to uncover? Well, there's something in the pasta, the Jap Japanese pastas that happen that I have to figure out how to do it. But it might happen on that big abstract. Fill the, do the field of color and then do something on top. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, then I just cover it up again. I just yeah, keep painting. Yeah, you start over. That's the... That little class that I took, um, the best advice, my, the teacher, we're really good friends now. Best advice he said was, your material and your art is not precious. Right, of course. None of it is precious. Right. Because I, I, I can ruin it at any second. Totally. But I, that's how I, that's the, you know, it's not a high wire act. It's just like, that's, I don't. You know, woo! -hoo! And if I screw it up, then I just paint over it, or it goes in a drawer. I use it later because I I'll do work since like like today. This is the best thing on the planet. Tomorrow, this is complete garbage. Yeah. And it's the same thing. So I've only ever thrown away or destroyed maybe two or three pieces. Wow. That's really, that's quite a thing right there. You know, right there. shove it in a drawer, put it away. I might be able to pull it out later and something clicks. And I just That use whole it. statement about it's not precious yeah. and understanding that. I mean, that's, that's the thing that frees you up. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to use all this. This is a really good paint. I don't want to use it all. Right. Just use it. Just use it. You know, my, my paint. brushes hate me because I'm not. I'm no, I'm I'm like. I mean, I even know. have my own moments where I buy a package of something, and then I find that I'm gravitating towards one color. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to use all that color because then I won't have a whole set anymore. How do I get one more color? I start doing this, you yeah, know? and I have to like let that go. Well, when I work in layers, so I make if I make a color, I'm good at making colors, mm -hmm. but if I don't have enough, mm -hmm. I can't make it again. Right. I don't so have, you don't want to make it again? I don't have the I don't have the patience to try to mix to match. Oh. So I hope the hell I have enough mm -hmm. to finish the layer. Then how do you keep your head out of being in that space though that that says I, I have to be miserly and Well no, I have to I have to make more oh. in the beginning. Ah. Okay. You know, I have to make sure I make enough to finish 
A lot of times it's like you're down to the last little part. It's like, oh, <laughs> come on, a little more, you know. Yeah, that would be frustrating. I never learned how to mix color. My guess is you probably already know. I know how to make color. I can't mix. I can't mix and match. I bet you could. Mm, I, I, I'm I not the drip, mix, drip, mix. I'm like... Oh, that that didn't work. <laughs> well, we'll put that over there and make it again. Do you no. see warm and colors, warm and cool colors very well? Warm versus cool. I like think if I, if I, I gave you two yellows and I said this one of them's warm and one of them's cool, would you know which one was which? No, I'd probably just say that's a good yellow. That's not a good yellow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's I mean, that's probably I, where the trip up is for you. Well, for mixing that same teacher. He goes, you're really good with color theory. Oh. And I'm just like, my color theory is I use colors I like. Oh, maybe he was talking about the way you put them together. Yeah. I mean, when I'm working on stuff, it's not, I look at the balance, you know, of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I might, and I, I have, I come up with patterns very vague patterns. I try to, if I'm doing it, I want to use the pattern throughout the whole thing. You know, so I don't know what that would be. That's not OCD. Um, I don't know what that is. It's, yeah, it's just I come up with I'm doing something and then, okay, there's this, like the big one I showed you. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing, I, it's a, a you said, a Samic writing. Yeah. But if I really concentrated or if I videotape myself and slowed it way down, every time I do this, it's the same number of moves. Oh, I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I totally get that. You know, yeah. or there'll be a motion every time. Right. You can't see it in the whole field, but right. it's there. And if I'm doing like a big field of this stuff, and if I stop, yeah. take a break, Come back tomorrow, my hand's doing something different. Right. I can see it, but no, you can't. Are you, you aware can't. of it while it's happening? That you're, yeah. That you're counting? And, and it's, it's, not, it's just natural. Yeah. I, it's a timing. It's a drummer thing, I think. It's a timing thing. Dun, 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 dip, dun, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dun. I've got yeah. some videos where I'm painting and you can kind of watch it happen. Yeah. You know. That's so interesting. You know, and the whole ascemic thing was a twist of between writing a, a doctor writing a prescription yeah. and somebody signing an autograph because it's scrawl. Right. For those of you that don't know, Samic as, writing, it's Asemic writing. It's A-S-C-E-M-I-C, -I, -I, I believe. I was just going to define what it was. So Asemic writing is like when you see somebody that ha it looks like handwriting, but you can't read it. Yeah. And it doesn't, it might even look like a letter or two, but it doesn't make any sense when you put yeah. it together. It's, it's automatic. It's, I call it auto, automa I call it auto script. Auto script, my, auto scroll, yeah. automatic writing sometimes is yeah. what they call it. And you see it sometimes in graffiti work. Yeah. You see it sometimes in just, I don't know, just so, some people's work when they, when they want it to look like it's a letter, but it's not a letter. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's clicked with me seeing, doors covered in graffiti tags yeah it becomes an abstract field and that's what clicked with me right you know here, i let don't me, let me see um there's a couple of things here uh, laura, laura says that she loves the idea of doing five artists in one i think that's a great idea too uh, Clifton says, working on more than one piece at a time allows me to mix generously and use the remainder on one of the other pieces. He was talking about your color mixing. Yeah. And then Georgia was asking about the ascemic writing. Yeah, I have. Uh, Do you have ascemic writing? I had, I had one of the pieces from the trip. Where is it at? Here he's looking. Oh, it's he's looking. All these pieces behind me, by the way. And this, I'm, I know there's a glare right here. Sorry. Ah. Uh, that's a semic right. Okay, so you can see how it looks like it's supposed to say something. It mimics handwriting in a, in a, in a sense, but it doesn't say anything. And someone told me about that word. I didn't know. I just yeah. called it auto script. Yeah, but no, I, I mean, it totally looks like exactly what you were talking about. It looks like 
doctor's prescription, uh, a signature, yeah, a crazy an autograph, signature. You know, yeah. So you just go. Did that in Kokoro, Japan. So I've, it's always where in the number. So I'm, I'm, number I'm, three I'm freaky about scanning everything, numbering everything, having it cataloged, and then it just goes in a box. But then you know. But, I mean, if you have it, you have it digitally now, too. So yeah, you yeah. Can, so you keep in track. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a freak about that. That's not a bad thing, I don't think. So... What are you gonna What are you gonna do with all your art? I mean, you, I, you, I, I I'd can't. Like, even, I'd like to sell it. <laughs> right, but I mean, what What if you don't? I mean, now are you? Oh, what if I don't? What, Family what gets you, to deal with it when I'm dead. Well, I mean, but have you thought about like willing it to a museum or something? I thought about my art collection about willing it to a museum, and that museum changed after 20 years. So I'm glad I didn't do it. Well, well, I'm still alive. You're still too. alive. You can always change. I that. gave. I I did donate some stuff to their collection. Did you? You know, but you know, it's like oh, I could do this, and then I'm just sort of like I don't know what to do it. I mean, I guess at some point I would sell some of the collection, you know, but that's gonna hurt, you know, unless I need a down payment on a house in Portugal. Okay, I can sell two or three of these. I don't need 12 paintings by this artist. Right. But I, I want to do the book. You know, that, but that's also me stopping and just writing. Right. I mean, you to do the book, you have to start the book. I, I've got 10 or 15 of them already written. Oh, you have? Oh, good. I started. You did. But then I haven't gone back. And oh. they're, they're short. It's all maybe two, three, four lines. You know, but I just need to get it out of my head you know, and get it down somewhere. So at least the history is there mm -hmm. in case I get hit by a bus or something. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just trying to like brainstorm for a second about, you know, where, what. I mean, for the longest time I did art happen? tours out of suitcases. Mm -hmm. I had all these old suitcases. I had lights in them and everything was, you know, plastic and, had a board so you could flip like records and I would mm -hmm. set up shows in garages, bars, warehouses. I even set up a show on a bush one time out of the van, you know, but that was a good way to make it fun, more direct, mm -hmm. you know, but then it just got too expensive to drive everywhere. Right. You know, That's so, um, and now people, that whole suitcase idea is everywhere now. Can I can I take down your last supper? Can we show everybody your last <laughs> supper piece? I want this is a piece that I walked in and I was I was looking at it and I was like this is so cool. Um, this is a paint by numbers thing that Jeff found I think at a thrift store. Yeah, and it, it was, was partially painted. It was partially done. It was partially painted. All the earth tones and stuff like and and this sort of work was already done. And then Jeff added his own thing to it, which is really cool. So took the, the Posca markers with full color. All the bright and colors. Just kind of winged it. And then, you know, the shades over everybody's eyes. And I just, Laura, tell me if this doesn't remind you of somebody that we know. Um, but I just, it's so fun. I just love seeing this in this kind of color scheme. It's really, it's great. I just love it. And this somebody else started it and he finished it. Yeah. It's from 1971, you said. Yeah, I think that's when I. And I had the I had the painting for 15 years or so. Found it in a drawer. Oh. Oh, no. can I just finish no, doing something do with this. that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right, let me see how we're doing on time here. Oh, wait, so we're we're cooked. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. That. Uh, Laura says that's fab. I think it speaks to the recovering Catholic in me. Yes, it does. Yes, okay. it reminds it, it reminds her of my grandfather as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Well. Cool. Thank you. Got anything you want to tell these people before you leave? Not really. Keep making stuff. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You know. It's all an adventure. Yeah. I can't wait to see what adventures you go on next because you've been everywhere. Well, I've been kind of well been stuck. All during COVID, 
you know. That's so, just a couple of that's just a couple of years out of the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean, it's a couple of years, part. five six hundred paintings. Yeah, that's <laughs> real stuff. Five or six hundred paintings. Gosh. You know. Oh, Laura says so. that that also reminds her of uh, there was a picture that somebody had done of uh, the Last Supper, and it was the last Happy Meal with all McDonald's mm -hmm. products and stuff. And she was yeah. just saying that it reminds me. You, um, Laura says, you are very inspirational and aspirational. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Cool. All right. Keep all making right. stuff. As per Jeff, thank you guys for joining us. Sorry about the... Um, the, the desert lag. Yeah, the internet the desert issues lag. that we had when yeah. you had to refine me. I apologize, yeah. but hopefully it was worth it. Okay. Okay, guys. Cool. All Have right. a nice day. See you day. later. Thanks See again. You later.